Okay, so let's look a little bit at, so Katrina comes and hits, and just a little quick first before we go back to the statistics. Um, so, this is after Katrina hits, destroyed land. A lot of this stuff, so we're looking at different um, uh, areas along the coast of Louisiana. This thing right here, this is natural. This meandering, this, right? So nature abhors a straight line unless it's a crystal. So what's, what's, the, what's the which one? Uh, just, just some land. So the sun is hitting this, so this is water. I want you guys to look at this, though. So here you go, this channel. So natural curved. Look at this guy, curved, right? Curvy. Here's this, this ch channel. Curvy, curvy, curvy. What? Artificial. Straight. What? Artificial. So this is an oil and gas channel. <coughs> how do I know? Because that's how they went, go in to get gas. So water, you float a boat. Land, you drive out to drill your wellhead. Here, this wetland is a not system. It's not dry and it is not underwater. It's this kind of betwixt between thingamajigger. Yeah? So what's the easiest thing to do is to float a barge to try to make it like a water area. So what you do is you get a crane and you go and you scoop out the sediment, the dirt, and then the crane is sitting in one spot and the crane spins and you open the bucket and you dump the sediment. You spin back, scoop, turn, dump. And, you, and then you put the crane on a, or the, the crane on a floating barge and then you drag that barge along. And so that's what this is right here. So this is an area that was excavated, and then the spoils, the sediment, is dumped right next to the channel. So that does two things. One, it makes a channel where you can float, but two, it makes a dry, dry land area where you could maybe drive a truck or something on or, or pull that, pull, float, you know, you know, tug that barge down this way. So this whole landscape is littered with these linear channels. We may or may not talk to some folks when we get uh, into Louisiana about this story, but the short version is all these folks that did this signed contracts. So just like our oil and gas folks here. Hey, we're going to put this oil and gas wellhead in. When we're done, when the well is played out, when there's nothing left, we will cap it and we will restore the area. Maybe that means planting trees, maybe that means putting grass, whatever, right? That's what they legally agree to do. Same thing here. All these people have dished out this wetland that already is massively Swiss cheesed. Yes, sign legal documents with the federal government, with the local government, with the state government. We will, when we're done, we will restore this area. Almost no one has done that. They've absolutely walked away. And a couple years ago, when some people started to say, hey, one of the reasons that the impacts from Katrina were so great were because of wetland loss, partly caused by the failure of you to live up to your contract. They changed the state constitution so folks couldn't sue them. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, again, same thing. These, these linear channels, these are artificial. These are human uh, caused or human, hu human created. So just look a little bit um, at some of the out outlying islands. Now, we don't have this type of structure here. Our coast, west coast, very young, geologically up down. We're talking about this much more gradual, shallow shelved coastline. So, okay, so we're looking at this area, the southeast part of Louisiana. And then we zoomed in here. And so the Bird's Foot Delta, you can see there, Lake Pontchartrain, you can see there, right? Reference, everybody can start to see where we are these days. And then we have these these uh, necklaces of sand called barrier islands. In this case, these are the chandelier islands. We're gonna zoom in on there. And this is what we see in these, on these barrier islands. So the, the part facing the open ocean, it tends to be sandy, beach, dune kind of. Well, it's a beach, then behind the beach is dunes. And then in the protected side, that's where you get actual wetlands. So more vegetated, complete vegetation and that kind of stuff. And so here's, here's uh, the same site for reference. This is 2001, obviously before Hurricane Katrina. And the same site 
after Katrina. Oh, sorry, sorry, both these sites are before, two, before Katrina, 2001. So this is after, right? So this is this one storm event, ripped all that stuff out. So like I said, in some areas, this one storm jumped us ahead 50 years in terms of, you know, had the storm not happened, what we estimate the, the loss rate of the wetlands. So huge problems. Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's Spartina and and stuff that uh, you know if we were to walk out, the stuff would be like to our hips or to our thighs, kind of high, a gr gr grassy herbaceous stuff here. Uh, so this is an area that was before the storm was all contiguous vegetation. So now we're essentially um, looking looking sort of landward here, um, and so all of this area. Is all the areas in red are now essentially open water after the storm. And so that means these areas now have been ripped open. It's going to be a lot easier for the rest of this area to be ripped out. Why? So imagine you're in your bathtub and you're sitting there and you lean forward and you blow. You, you blow under the water surface, right? So if I just can, and maybe, maybe I put my hands up, I cup my hands and I blow into my hands. Little teeny waves hit, hit my fingers, yeah? Because there's not much, there's, my, my blowing is only picking up an inch or so worth of water. If instead I took my hands away and I leaned forward in the bathtub and I, now I blow over a couple feet of, of water. And now those little teeny tiny waves can get big and they slosh, splash, slosh, splash. So having lost this water, and again, this is the same kind of thing that the nutria do, now we have this place where this wind can rip e be even more powerful. Because now it doesn't just blow over an inch, it blows over a meter, or tens of meters, or hundreds of meters. And then the force of that water, that rippage, that wave smacking on the remnant vegetation is that much stronger. Then it rips that out. And then the next windstorm that comes through is gonna be even more powerful, et cetera. So this shear is another part of how how these storms really get in and, and rip out this this marsh. So this is an area we went down. We went down to Holly Beach right after Katrina. Uh, John and I. Tom wasn't. Was Tom with us? No, Tom wasn't with us then. Um, so we're down. There. So now this is Holly Beach. This is so New Orleans, southeast. Holly Beach, we're northwest. We're almost into Texas. So the other side of the state of Louisiana. So several hour drive, like five hour drive or so um, east. And so this is, uh, this is Holly Beach, also known as the Redneck Riviera. Merry Christmas. So now, uh, you know, if you and I want to go get land in Malibu, we need to like make a movie or something, right? Or fall in front of some millionaire and sue him or something, right? Um, this is a place where, and, and you know, the south, it gets hot in the summer. It gets hot and humid. And if you're sort of inland or in an area that doesn't have a lot of wind, it can be pretty, pretty tough, especially before uh, air conditioning. So this was a place that folks of modest means could have a little shack, essentially, and, and go to the coast. And when it's the hottest you know, weeks of the month or the weekend or whatever, you can go and, and, and have some cool breezes kind of thing, yeah? So this is what it was like before Hurricane Katrina. This is what it was like just after Hurricane Katrina. And so this is some LIDAR mapping. So again, before on the top, after on the bottom. And um, so the green is all the elevated, these are the houses that looks, it looks like monopoly houses. These are the houses before and after. And this is, this is the relative rate of change. In addition to Katrina, three weeks later, Hurricane Rita came. Hurricane Rita was the thing that really clobbered these folks. So we had one, one hurricane, whoop, the east side of Louisiana. And then right after, whoop, another one hit the west side. This is what Holly Beach looked like when we got there in, in a, about a year later. Twilight zone kind of stuff going on here. So, there's streets, you can see the streets, but that's kind of all there is. That's not supposed to be dirt roads, right? No, it's, not, it's, it's sand. It's not dirt, it's sand. 
So, so if we see like where the truck, the white truck is in the distance, that's like the ocean edge. So, um, so super surreal. So everything is gone or virtually everything's gone. Just literally like a giant with like a kid making a sandcastle, put his hand in the sand and just everything's gone. Except we have some of these strange programs. So, so the fire hydrants mostly survived, but then this pr program was to come in and make the roads safe. And so they put up stop signs. <laughs> so this is another phenomenon of these, of, of these post-disaster areas, which is, it's, just, it's, it's kind of surreal when things happen. Like, oh, all of a sudden there's this guy selling ICs. You're like, what, a guy selling ICs or, or something like that. So essentially all these houses are gone. Like, so we're facing where our butt is, our back is facing the marsh and the house is in the materials are all jammed up in the marsh, Walker. No, the storm. The storm literally blew everything away. Yeah. So remember, this is not California. We had big tides a couple weeks ago, plus six feet, plus five feet. This, our rental car here, this red car, right now we're probably at on the road. We're probably like plus two and a half feet, plus one foot above sea level. This is a very flat place. So it only takes a little bit to get problematic, let alone a big giant storm surge. More on that in a little bit. Uh, we've already talked about this, but again, this whole system is a human dominated system. We saw the examples of the oil and gas, uh, people, this whole area, there's just, there's just tons and tons of people all throughout. Um, New Orleans itself is something of a, a bit of a bowl. So we'll talk about this being, this isn't exactly, but this is a quick and dirty, roughly where the city of New Orleans is, right? So it really is almost like an island in, in a lot of respects. So we have the big ponte train, the big water body on top. On, on the bottom, we have the Mississippi River. And in theory, you can go right or left, but that's not super easy with waterways and things like that. So it's, it's much more akin to being on an island, even though we're on the continent of the US. Um, certainly when any kind of constraint happens to your movement, like a road goes down or something, it, it's, it's not like we're in the middle of Iowa and we could in theory go right, left, up, down, northwest or whatever. Um, Another, another thing to set this up, and then we'll go back to look at some of our data from the hurricanes in two, 2005. But um, it, the city was not built below sea level. There's been subsidence. So the stuff has lowered since the original city started to be built. Two, we have sea level rise and stuff like that going on, right? So, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of misimpressions here, but but I just want to sort of, I'm sort of exaggerating this for you guys to see the point. But so um, every, a lot of, another misconception is people think the Mississippi River flooded New Orleans. No. The only levees to not fail at all during Hurricane Katrina were the Mississippi River levees. How did, how did New Orleans flood? It flooded from the sea. It flooded from Lake Pontchartrain. So what we're doing here, and on this diagram right here, this is a sort of really cartoony version. Here's like Ponch Train in dark blue. Here's the Mississippi River in this light blue. And so we're just doing a, a exaggerated tra 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 uh, transect, right, from A to B. So here we go. So this is what's going on. The Mississippi River is higher than sea level. If you think about it for a second, it has to be because it's flowing down into the ocean, right? If it was below sea level, the ocean would be flowing into the river. So it is higher than sea level. So you'd think, oh my gosh, that's the thing that's the most dangerous. That's the highest, st starting off, that's the highest uh, elevation of water. Um, Lake Pontchartrain is ultimately what's, the, the levees protecting the city from Lake Pontchartrain are, are ultimately what fails and, and that's how the seawater gets in. Um, again, well known, let's see if this works. So this is three meters, four meters, five meters, six meters, 
right? So this is what happens if we were to raise the water around New Orleans. Um, it, it ain't high. So this is a very flat land. You'll see we start driving around, it's very flat. So water tanks are, are cool things in this area because that's where you, kids can climb up and, or people can climb up and get a perspective of the, of the lay of the land. Very, very flat. Okay, so let's get back to what happened in 2005. So here are the things we need to have a hurricane. So we firstly have to have a warm, um, wow, why do my C's and F's look weird like that? I don't, it seems like medical marijuana is going on or something. So warm ocean, so relatively warm water, and I mean like really warm water, like you get in the water and you're like, ooh, the water feels warm. That's going to provide the fuel for this, this mechanism we're going to talk about. We then need um, an atmospheric phenomenon that we have really, really fast cooling and air moving up and cooling and condensing very rapidly. That's going to act like a fireplace. Like if we, if we had a, a fire in the bottom of a fireplace and the, the heat starts going up and it creates its own air movement and then the air coming in from the home uh, uh, goes into the flame log area and it helps fuel the flame. Uh, the troposphere, which is the sort of far up atmosphere, is another helps with the fuel. Um, we cannot have an equator. Uh, we cannot have an equator. We cannot have a hurricane if we're at the equator. It won't happen because of this Coriolis for force um, and the cyclogenesis, the, the the starting of the spinning. We have to be at least 500 kilometers from the equator so that we, we never, so Ecuador never has a hurricane. Okay, uh, and then we need something that we don't fully understand. We need some kind of spark, it's unclear. A lot of this seems to maybe have to do with dust storms off, off the Sahara, African dust storms, but, but it's not entirely clear. There's some, but there's some kind of spark, something that, that starts off this system. Why did they Uh, sort of blowing, blowing from uh, sort of the north part of Africa uh, westward, because that seems to be associated with these things. And isn't the winds up there, are they really that strong or anything like that, that can force yeah. it? Yeah. Is it like what, ripple effect? So, so with, all of these, with all of these sort of large scale climate things, when you talk to the, the atmosphere guys, they're like, oh, it's caused the, it starts in the water. You talk to the water guys like, oh, it starts in the atmosphere. So we don't really, we don't fully understand. So clearly, once we start going down the path, we understand how that progresses. But as the actual thing, it's not entirely, if, if we knew it, in theory, we could go stop it. You know, sort of Superman or something like that, but we don't know. But is it multiple things? It's, it, it, well, it, multiple things have to go right. That's the key thing. The key thing is that we're not sure exactly how it starts, but we have to have all six of these things. If we're missing one of these things, ain't gonna happen. Or we'll have a little storm, but it won't be, it won't be a, a, a hurricane. So the last thing is vertical wind shear. This is, this is strong winds have to be absent. Because right when we're starting to form, if we have these cross winds and things that blow up, it'll, it'll, it'll mess it up. It's just like the water is going down. I keep using bathtub analogies, sorry. <laughs> but if you're in your bathtub and you pull the plug, tunk, right, the water starts going down. A lot of times you're just sitting there, uh, you know, if you're bored and something, you just, just watch the water go down, whoosh, right? Whereas if the water is almost down, you take your finger and you, you do a little circle around the drain, it'll whoosh, it'll start a little funnel. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of like, that's what we're talking about. Like, do we have all the, we get everything ready, but, but if, if we don't have that kind of, you sticking your finger in and swirling, 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 you won't necessarily get that cyclonic spinning nature. Okay, so we already talked about this, we already ran over this. So this is what happened. So this is the data from 2005, or excuse me, from, from 1950 to 2005. Tropical storm on the left, hurricanes on the middle, major hurricanes on the right. Same 
exact thing. Don't be fooled by the name. Same exact phenomenon, same exact goings on. It's just how strong are they? How fast is the, are the, are the wind speed? So a tropical storm isn't quite as strong as a hurricane, which isn't quite as strong as a major hurricane. But the underlying process, identical between these things. We call them hurricanes. If we go to the, the Pacific, the, the Eastern Pacific, we call them typhoons. Same exact thing. I'll, I'll show you right now. So, okay, so, what, so the question is, what counts as major hurricanes? It's speed. So have a look right here. So, so anytime we have a, uh, you know, a, a year, we're going to have, you know, we're likely to have at least some tropical storms, probably have at least, you know, a couple hurricanes. Maybe we'll have major hurricanes. Well, what does that mean? Okay, so here we go. If we averaged all the years over this 55-year period, right, we would have on average 10 tropical storm. This is hitting the hitting Louisiana, you know, southeastern US. Okay? Making it in other words making it to US landfall. Okay? So overall, uh, we have about 10 tropical storms, about 6 hurricanes and and two or so major hurricanes. You guys with me? So as we go up, so this would be below normal, 6.9 tropical storms, 3.7 hurricanes, one a little bit over on average one major hurricane. Something near normal is about 10, about six, and about two major hurricanes. An above normal season, this would be considered, oh my God, this is dangerous, right? 13 tropical storms, eight hurricanes, and four major hurricanes. This is the prediction, okay? This is the, remember I said there, there were two, there were two uh, systems doing this, the, the NCAR and the National, Weather, uh, the National Hurricane Center. So that's why I have two numbers here. But so the prediction, this is the way that we predicted before the hurricane season started, 18 to 21 tropical storms, nine to 11 hurricanes, and five to seven major hurricanes. The low end was five major hurricanes. That was what we predicted. This is what actually happened. We had 28 tropical storms. We had 15 hurricanes and seven major hurricanes. It, it, it's, it's hard to explain to you guys here how unusual that was. So people were screaming it was going to be a problem. And we, and we, pet, look, we blew doors on the, on the high estimates here. Blue doors on the high estimates here tied the high estimate here, right? This is crazy. Um, it's, I'll, I'll, if, when we take a break, I don't think I have the video embedded, but I'll play it for you. Um, we, ran out, we ran out of names for hurricanes. Never happened before in the history. So uh, for each of the regions, the folks in, in Southeast Asia and, and that part of the Pacific, the folks here in the Americas, the Atlantic seaboard, uh, we have these conventions. So what happens every couple years, folks from these international atmospheric meteorological groups get together and they decide on names for each year. So we, we alternate the country of, we take turns. So some years they're American names, some year they're Mexican names, right? And we, we just kind of rotate around and we decide this ahead of time. So we're like, hey, the next one up, we go alphabetically. So we start with the storm named A, and then B, and then all the way down to Z. For the first time in history, we ran, we got to Z, and we were still in hurricane season. So then we started, you know, alpha, beta. I mean, people are like, what the hell do we do, right? Nobody had ever envisioned needing more names than, 20, you know, than the letters of the alphabet. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Okay, so here we go. Here's that uh, above average sea surface temperature. So the top plot, this is, this is the temperature in the top, you know, little skim edge of the top film of the ocean. So the red is hot. And so you can see the hurricanes are gonna, and so that, that, that uh, those bands there, that, that uh, the black band, that's where we cannot have hurricanes in between there. So the hurricanes are either gonna be south of that or north of that. And so, 
there we go. So we have, uh, right? So look, when it, when it hits, when it starts kind of colder off towards Africa. As soon as we start getting close to the US, hotter, 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 hotter. So right when it's, and we saw that when we saw the cyclogenesis of, of Katrina, right? When I showed that video, they start get closer and they start to spin more and it becomes distinct and the eye forms, boom. Uh, and then, and okay, so that, that's just the average temperature of the ocean. Then the bottom one is the same, same kind of idea at sea surface temperature, but here is anomalies. This is deviation from the long-term average. Again, the, the redder, the, the even more warmer than it otherwise would be body of water. And again, right when we get tight into the coast, it's getting crazy hot. So right when we hope the, you know, we have some cool water to start slowing down the speed of the hurricane, it's intensified. Um, and then just, we have very low wind shear. So this allows the hurricane when it builds up to not be blown apart. I already showed you guys that, that's Hurricane Katrina when it becomes a category five storm. I'll mention this several times we're not going to talk about the politics today. We'll talk about that in another talk. But um, there's a lot of BS that goes around with these disasters these days, right? It's a category five out at the ocean, in the ocean. We'll hear from our Army Corps of Engineers colleagues. They'll say, look, the hurricane prevention system was only designed to protect up to a category three storm. That's what Congress legally mandated us to build. So couldn't stop it. Baloney. Category four right here. As it gets to mainland, it actually starts to, to dissipate a bit. Category four. Category three at landfall. By the time it gets to New Orleans Lake Pontchartrain, it is a category one storm. So yes, it was a category five out to sea, but when it was stressing the flood protection system of the city of New Orleans, it was in fact a category one, which in theory should have been well within the design parameters of the flood protection system. So just to be clear on that. Uh, we already saw this video. Oh, here's a bit, does this even play? Oh yeah, great. Well, we'll watch it anyway. So here, so this is overlaying all these storms um, you know, simultaneously. Kind of common for what's going on these days. But okay, all right, getting back to our start subject. Here we go. Now, the hurricane, uh, Katrina actually technically made landfall first when it touched the tip of Florida. Okay, but, but leaving that behind now, Katrina has jumped into the, uh, it jumped into the uh, rest of the Gulf and it comes on and it, it curves up and it shoots straight up. So here we go. So at this point, um, as the hurricane's approaching, Bay St. Louis, Mississippi records the um, uh, then highest, I believe it still stands, the highest recorded storm surge ever um, in the US. So what's storm surge? Let's go back to my bathtub analogy. So bathtub, let's imagine we have a hairdryer. Don't kill yourself. We put the hairdryer horizontal in the bathtub and, and have, it, have the air blowing you know, parallel to the surface of the water. And, and, and leave it there. You hold your hand there. What's going to happen? It's going to start to blow. And then there's, it's going to pile up water. Right? It's going to lump up water. And it's going to be kind of a wave, a lumpy wave. And it's kind of, whoa, it's going to go. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to slop up against the side of the tub, right? And it's going to be piled up there. That is what storm surge is. We hear the term storm surge. Sometimes we think of like a surging tide, like whoosh, slop in, slop off. No, it is a lump of water that's pushed out in front of the cyclone. And so this lump of water, it doesn't, it's not like a 30 foot, uh, like wave, like ah, boom, and then crash and then goes out. This is elevated water level for two, four, six, eight hours. So the, the ocean just gets 30 feet higher and stays that way for hours. Campus, what are we? We're about 15 feet above sea level, 20 feet above sea level, right? So if we had that here, we would have water in some of the, some of the buildings on campus. 
So this is huge. And again, I can't explain this up. This is pancake land, man. This is flat, 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 flat. There's no Santa Monica Mountains. There's no Los Padres. There's no, there's no topography to break it up. So this is insane. Right? The storm surge goes right over uh, uh, this area and it just inundates everything. Right. Um, after Katrina first hits, we have this huge disaster area declared. I have not color coded this little part down here in, tech, in uh, Florida. This was also part of the national um, uh, uh, disaster de declaration. But look at this, all this area, all this hatched area was declared a federal disaster. And to give you some scale, here's California, right? So we're talking, you know, a huge chunk of the state of California, all of it under uh, a, d a disaster declaration huge area is impacted by the storm. Okay, let's get back to what happens in the storm. Okay, storm comes in, boom. So the initial thing we all see is the, is the water, is the flooding, right? So we see that in terms of like the lower left picture, the, the, and this is a great example of storm surge, right? Look at that, it's not, it's not a wave, it's just all of a sudden everything has gone subtidal because the storm surge has raised this, the elevation of the ocean. Okay. Uh, then we have all the pictures of, the, of like the folks up in the right hand picture, you know, they're like, ah, there's, there's wind blowing on them, like, what? Weatherman, you know, oh my God, it's so windy. So we have those images. And then pretty quickly, we start to see some of the impacts. So for example, in the lower right, where, where in this case, a brick wall was not able to withstand the conditions and it crumbled and cracked and, and uh, in this case, fell on some vehicles. And then after the, the main uh, storm, uh, blasts through, we have something like this. This is Canal Street in New Orleans, and it, it's, you know, people are walking through water. So this, this water's been dumped, and it's not going anywhere fast. Flooding. Okay, so the f first thing, oh my god, everything's flooded, oh my god, what are we going to do? And so, uh, this, we're looking at a broken levee. So this is the area that should have the water retained. The water is flooding out here and it's flooding into this, into the city here. Here's another levee that we'll go see. This, so here's a flood wall, boom. This should be where the flood wall is. It ain't there no more. It's crumbled in and it's moved inland and this water is poured in and, and taken out these houses and flooded these houses. Here's some folks in a, in a boat. A lot of folks needed to be rescued by the Coast Guard. Um, in fact, our, friend, uh, our, our friends were some of the people that created the system, Iver Van Heerden, that, that helped these folks find uh, where people were. So their GIS operations center took the, uh, at, at Louisiana State, took people's addresses, click, 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 turn them into Latin lawns, and then they phoned the Coast Guard and said, oh, somebody needs to be rescued at this latitude and longitude. And then you have you know, huge whole neighborhoods like this that are just, should be dry that are underwater. Okay, so let's look, okay, here we go. This is now Lake Pontchartrain on the right. Here's the city of, or the start of the city of New Orleans. This is northward, this is uh, over here is southward. But I wanna zoom in on some areas here. So check this out. So interestingly, as opposed to what we normally think of with Hurricane damage, I mean, of course, there's a lot of roof damages, roof damage, but look, by and large, these roofs are intact. The wind has not ripped apart these roofs. So yeah, there are a few areas where we can see clear damage, clear, clear uh, 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 something fell through or something ripped off, but mostly what we're talking about is hydrology, the elevation of the ground is what drove how screwed you were. So these guys over, these folks over here, they're screwed. They're relatively low land. These guys up here, relatively okay, they're relatively high ground. That's not normal for a hurricane. This is what happened. This is the, this is the uh, flood, so-called flood protection system that was put in place beginning with 1965. So uh, uh, Betsy comes through 1965, 
What are we going to do? The president goes down, stands in the lower ninth ward, where we will spend some time, and says, never again. We will not allow this city to be flooded. We will not allow these folks to be uh, uh, flooded. So they go back to Congress and they say, we want to fund a flood protection system. Now, it is true that the flood protection system was never fully funded. So, so the Army Corps of Engineers, which is the entity that is charged with doing this type of stuff for the government, more about them later, uh, they uh, were charged with doing this, but every year they'd have to go to Congress. Can we have some money to build this part? Can we have some money to build this part, et cetera? This is what they ultimately build. Right over here, Lake Pontchartrain, okay? Here is the Mississippi River. And what we've done is we've put a series of walls to protect things. Again, if you recall, this area, where am I? This area here, the area right next to, as we talked about last week, the area around the river, the natural levee is there. That's the high ground. That's the, I doesn't seem to make sense at first, but that's the driest next to the river. This was the area first settled. So the French Quarter, old original settlement, relatively dry ground. As the city expands, people move more and more into the swampy, into the less desirous, into the more problematic areas of the region. And they eventually move all the way out to Lake Pontchartrain. So one of the things we did was utilize the natural bayou system, utilize the natural rivers and channels. And we tried to augment that. And so that's what we're seeing here. So there's Gentilly Ridge, there's all these different, there's all these different, can you see this? These, these sort of linear structures. These weren't made by people. These were augmentation of existing drainage uh, aspects of the hydrology of this region. So what we did was we, kept, we, put, this, we put these things in here and we decided what we'd do is we would cut these guys off more distinctly from the rest of the city. We would stick straws in the ground, suck that water out, dump that water over these, these walls and let gravity drag it down into Lake Pontchartrain. That's essentially what the flood protection system is supposed to do. What happened in uh, Katrina is it failed in a gazillion million places. So each of these little dots, dot, 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 it's all a place where the, where the flood protection system broke. And so instead of water going from here into here and then into here, it reversed course. It came from here and it flooded through here and it went into the city from the ocean. So again, it wasn't a levee broke or two levees broke or three levees broke. There was something like 28, or I forget how many there were. There, there, there were a gazillion. All these things needed to be repaired. And remember we talked about New Orleans being sort of like a bowl? Once we let the water in, we were kind of screwed. This is an insane picture. Probably one of the most insane pictures I've ever seen. Unclear exactly who took this photo, but this was taken by a guy, this was taken by a maintenance worker and what we're, we're looking north here uh, uh, into Lake Pontchartrain. And what looks like a wave, this is actually the top of the levee. So the sea surface has been raised over the levee and this water is pouring in. How this person lived is insane. It's hard to actually believe. But this is the city flooding from the sea, not the river. Uh, we'll go around and we'll see some of these things. This is, this is another one of the ones that I go like, what? This is the craziest, like, what? One, because one time we got robbed here. But another reason, because, <laughs> because so this is, I'm looking, I'm looking down one of these drainage canals, okay? So my, my butt is towards the city. We're facing Lake Pontchartrain. So Lake Pontchartrain is down over here, okay? So this is Orleans Canal. This is one of those drainage canals. So let's check it out. So this, right, right here, this is a levee. This is an earthen embankment. You guys with me? This is, okay, so now you can imagine, hey, the water got this high, it'll be safe. But then what if we flood? Oh my God, it'll overtop. So that's where we put in the flood wall, which is a metal or concrete structure that's gonna give us extra containment. 
Now the flood wall is not meant to hold water there permanently. Flood wall is meant to contain it during just a few hours of a flood, right? So the only the reason why this area, <laughs> yeah, it's all insane there. Um, so the reason why these folks weren't even more screwed than they otherwise would have been, this, this neighborhood just to the right of the photo flooded, they only flooded a little bit. Why? Because they only flooded for a couple hours when, when the storm surge was shoving up the water. As soon as the storm surge died, it went away. Because this, this levee here did not fail. Why did it not fail? So check this out. Uh, again, you paid for all this. Thank you, people, for building this for our friends in New Orleans. <laughs> dirt, 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 dirt. Uh, flood wall, flood wall, flood wall, flood wall. Uh, what? The flood wall, stop. So a, a link, a chain, is only as strong as the weakest link, right? Uh, where is the flood wall here? So, if I were to turn around, right, if I spin around to face the opposite direction, you would see a brick building right here. That is a pump house. We'll see these when we go to New Orleans. They're pumping water, moving water around the city. This particular one is right next to a, a, uh, a pump house that handles sewage water. Brick, old brick building. Beautiful old, old classic New Orleans architecture. When they were hooking this up, like, uh, dude, we shouldn't connect this wall to that brick wall because what if the wall fails? It'll rip down the bricks and the poop will go in the water. That's a bad idea. So they therefore did not connect the flood wall. So they built all this that does nothing. Does literally nothing if there's a whole hole here. So to be clear, this wasn't like going to be done next week or next year. This has been this way for a while. So ironically, again, this is why these guys were okay. Probably if they had built this, this flood wall, it would have flooded and eventually this would have flooded catastrophically and this whole area would have been underwater for weeks and weeks. As it was, this particular neighborhood was only underwater, it was the only a little, only, you know, ankle deep water came in. As opposed, if this whole thing had failed, they would have been, you know, chest deep or, or a st one story underwater. So they kind of lucked out because they were poor planners. Yes. Yeah, so, so when we're there, I'm going I'm to send you guys a document. So when we're there, um, our friend that used to give all these fantastic tours, he's now retired. So he's an emeritus professor, but, um, but he used to give us all these tours. So I'll, I'll do a poor imitation of him, but we're going to go see a lot of these places and we'll talk about that. But yeah, so, so this gets, we have to sort of spend some time and look at these structures and, and get into them. But, but yeah, so one of the problems was there's there, <laughs> many, 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 many problems with the design of the system. One of which these things should be driven down crazy oh shit crazy deep crazy crazy deep down into impervious stuff clay so that we can imagine if there's a if we pile up a bunch of water here the water can't squeeze underneath if it was put on let's say beach sand and we piled up a bunch of water it would squeeze underneath and it would eventually like brrr, you know squirt out here and eventually compromise the structural integrity of this area so that's one of the ways it would fail um, eye walls and T walls. We'll hear more about these. Eye walls, cheap. T walls, better, more expensive. What do you think they mostly put in? Eye walls. Why? Because it's cheap. Yes. So you guys should always be answering why. You guys should, or I mean, always be asking. Excuse me, why. Why, 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 why? It's not cheap for the moment, but when something happens, more expensive. That's correct. That's correct. It's all. When the last big fire hit paradise, 
there was a plan to how are we going to rebuild and people decide, oh, it's too expensive. Now we're looking for 20,000 people to have a home, right? So I completely agree. I completely agree. We do this stuff ultimately to make things better and ultimately to save money, right? Your president right now says doing something to deal with climate change is too expensive. I would respectfully disagree. Not doing something is too expensive. But those are the, these are the debates we have to have with folks in a reasoned manner that doesn't translate into calling people names and, and, and saying you're stupid. We have to use facts and we have to use these experiences. So I would, I, I argue one of the, one of the great values, I think I already said this to you guys, but one of the great values of Hurricane Katrina isn't so much was it caused by climate change or did climate change make it worse, it probably did, but much more, it is, it is, the, it is what we're gonna be dealing with. So this is a window into what we can expect in a much grander scale. And if you thought Katrina was bad, when, this, when Bang, what happens in Bangladesh, or places that have even less fiscal wherewithal, oh man, it gonna be ugly. It's gonna be unjust, it's gonna be evil, it's gonna spurn all this horrible crap. And so we also wanna do this so that we avoid the worst demons of our nature and stuff and when those things are released when we start yelling at immigrants and start yelling at people that don't look like us and all that kind of horrible crud. So, for example, Army Corps of Engineers said, oh, we didn't know this could fail. These diagrams, this diagram here on the left, it's from an Army Corps of Engineers experiment. And they showed, and this showed exactly how at least some of these flood walls failed. In this case, it's an I wall. I because it's just straight up and down like the letter I. And so here we go. So here is some sand. You guys got this diagram with me? Here's some sand. So this was permeable. So if we poured water in the water, would it quickly, quickly, pass through the, the set of it. Uh, and then here it, oops, where am I pointing? And then here's some uh, other sediments. This would be like, say, wetland sediments, stuff with or, uh, kind of silty organics. And then this is really what we want, which is our, it, which is our um, uh, clays, our silts, or stuff that's very, very hard for water to easily go through. So this is how we think at least some of these wall levees have failed. So here the red line is where the wall started. But this eye wall is just up and down, right? So if we put continued pressure on it, it's not, it's not structurally robust. So if we, have, if we elevate the water level for anything more than a few minutes or an hour or so, it's just sideways pressure, huge pressure shoving. And eventually it starts to kind of, starts to you know, tip. Then when it tips, it creates this gap between the wall and the, and the sediment that water goes in and then just like the fetch that we were talking about with the, with the wetland, the wind, now there's even more area for the water to uh, shove against and it pushes even, essentially it pushes even stronger and then the whole thing goes this way, unk. This is a test tank. The, so, this, this is a small scale experiment, it's like the size of the table here. All these sediments were collected in the field. So this, this is a, a scale representation, but they're all real sediments and this showed exactly what happens. This is a slip failure right here and displacement failure. And we look at some of these like this particular, uh, um, that's what happened right here, right? So you can see here's the flood wall, but then somehow the flood wall has moved all the way over here. It, ha it followed this model at the 17th Street Canal. And so then this house, right? This, this was the, the top of the levee, which was here. The whole thing just kind of whoop went in, you know, Few dozens of feet and so everything just boom got got taken out so there's all kinds of problems failure systems but a lot of them have to do with ultimately poorly designed systems ultimately poorly constructed systems some of these guys aren't even going down into the clay some of these flood walls just go into the sand so there's no possible way that was ever permitted the army corps of engineers used to be engineers. Now they're project managers. They do no construction. They contract it all out to private contractors. 
So if, you, if you're not, and I'm not saying contractors are evil, but there needs to be oversight. If you're, not over, if you're not exerting oversight, if you're not checking, if you're not verifying that this is correctly built to these standards, what the hell is going on? Guess what? If you don't verify it, you get something like what happened to New Orleans. Um, okay, so fast forward. You guys are getting late. We'll go for a little bit more, then we'll break for tonight. Um, so here we go. Flooding, crazy flooding. So here is a shot. So all this light blue is New Orleans essentially underwater, or this region underwater. Um, initially, when we have these, these events, nature low on the priority scale, right? And so, uh, so figuring out what the ecological impact, very low, right? Got other things to deal with. And in fact, here's a press release from one of our premier federal agencies that manages nature and wildlife and stuff. And so these guys are all, the Fish and Wildlife Service are sucked out and they're gonna go help rescue people. The next thing that happens after that immediate damage, after that immediate uh, you know, flooding and the brick walls fall down and stuff, the next thing is people are like, what's up? I need some food. I need some diapers for my kid. I need, you know, what's gonna go on? And we tend to see a lot of social strife in these disaster situations, right? In Malibu, we saw, you know, the husbands of rock stars pull out guns and say, you know, do you, Malibu's strong, stay away, right? I mean, it starts to get crazy. Like, really? You white boy from Malibu are really all of a sudden super hard now with your gun and you're like a man or something, right? This happens all over the place, right? And people freak out, right? It's understandable, it's, 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 a, it's a stressful situation. You don't have complete information. Rumors start running wild. So you see scenes like this. So uh, folks, uh, you know, getting stuff, looting stuff, and it was, did looting happen? Tons of looting happened. But a large fraction of the quote unquote looting, I mean, these guys look like they're getting shoes and, and shirts and stuff, but, but the vast majority of the looting wasn't that vast majority of the looting was people trying to get water, trying to get uh, baby food, trying to get insulin for their moms or whatever, right? So here's this guy standing out in front of this, uh, I think it was a Walmart, um, and he's trying to keep order, but he's not like shooting people. He's like, you guys, calm down, right? It's very hard to convey to you guys how crazy it was. Um, so we have people in the United States of America, days afterwards, not able to get rescued. Not able to get rescued. So um, we had so-called shelters of last resort. These included the convention center, which you'll see, which is near the river, uh, uh, the football stadium. These were decommissioned after, before the storm because people said, hey, they're not safe for people to be in. We do not, do not go to the convention center. You know, don't do that. But then the reality is once the storm hits, what are people going to do? Like, they don't know. So they go to these places, they concentrate, and there's huge upheaval. So this guy's crying because there's a lady here that just died. Right? Somebody help me. Where's the authorities? Where's the police? Where's the, where's the this? Where's the that? What's this? This is the I-10. We'll drive on the I-10. What's that? I don't know. That's people. That is the New Orleans jail. So the jail was gonna go subtitle. So all the folks that were in jail were gonna drown. So they pulled everybody out, handcuffed them, took them up to, this is essentially an overpass, an elevated freeway, and they put them on here. But check it out, even the water is lapping up on the edge here. So well, what would it be like if you were a bunch of prisoners in 95 degree weather, 95% humidity, after a day, after two days, right? Guards are sitting there with guns. The guards don't even have a lot of water, right? Incredibly challenging conditions for everybody. Incredibly challenging conditions for everybody. Yes. Well, uh, not so much, a, not so much a convention center or 
Uh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is right. So these guys go on to the I-10 and they can't there's what they can't necessarily drive out, right? The next thing that happens is we start to realize how compromised the infrastructure is. So all these things. Here's a dude going through the streets. Ain't no truck going. He's in a boat. Uh, a lot of the street signs are ripped off. Even when we started going, you know, long after the floodwaters had been pumped, there was the first few trips, I didn't have a smartphone, and it was like, uh, what street is this? Who the hell knows? <laughs> So that, just the very logistics of getting around. Now, if you're a local, not a problem. But if you're a rescue team from Florida, you're like, uh, where, which, which, what, where am I, right? So it makes it more hard. Here is part of a, this is in Alabama, I think. But this is um, part of an oil rig on land. Here's a tanker on land. Yeah, exactly. How do you? <laughs> so when these things happen you basically have to come in and cut up the boat with welding torches and you know it takes weeks or months to pull these structures off of wherever they landed right here's a tank farm underwater guess what when they built when they build tanks like this they're designed to hold oil and stuff the weight of the of the liquid holds them down but when they're surrounded by water, oil floats. So some of these tanks floated off their foundations, spilling oil everywhere, or whatever the other substances were. You know, here's, here's a fire at a refinery. I mean, it's, 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 it's incredibly logistically challenging. Um, uh, we mentioned before the infrastructure, this is just some of the oil and gas stuff. Then we start to see things, then at a regional, at a national level, one of the things we start to see are things like, because this is the, one of the main oil and gas producing areas of our country, all of a sudden, boom, gas prices start to spike, right? So we start to see the pump within a day or two, whoosh. And so there's currently an investigation going on, uh, and, and these happen every so often, but it's interesting how disaster, boom, gas prices go up. Disaster over, takes a while to go back down. That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay, so the next thing, chaos, all this, like what's going on? We don't get it, we don't know. The next phase is when we finally begin to get our stuff together and start to assert control through mostly external help. National Guard, uh, 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 other local forces that come in and start to, to get stuff under control. Um, implement things like martial law and, 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 and that type of stuff to, to get people to make sure that bad things aren't happening, etc. Next phase, okay, so the city's flooded. So basically what we do is we let the city finish flooding and then once the flood waters come to sort of an equilibrium, then we can plug the holes and start to pump it. It's too hard to deal with when the water is rushing in like a river. And so that's what we're seeing here. So, and again, no manual for this. There's no how-to manual. So here we start flood, driving these uh, helicopters and dropping. At first, we started dropping these big bags of sandbags, and they would kind of fall down and just boom, hit, break open, and the sand would go over. We're like, that didn't work. So we very quickly realized we have to start picking them up and gently lower them into the breach and just keep lowering and lowering and lowering until we eventually get some kind of plug going on. Uh, the initial estimates were something like six week, six months. They ended up getting most of them plugged and drained in about three weeks. And most after, of the how long after three weeks? After? About, about uh, yeah, yeah, less than a month. Which is a, a Herculean effort. I mean, crazy effort. Um, and so, and then, so, you, so for example, here's a breach that they've now thrown enough stuff on that we actually kind of have a seal. This one is in progress, right? We we sort of rebuilt this area. You can see the original flood wall, or, or part of the original flood wall is here. Then we, and again, this is where, this is before the breach where water's pouring in. Here's this guy doing it with a, a excavator. And then once that's done, we start pumping the area out. Um, again, initially, the concerns for the environment are primarily about companion animals, primarily about pets and pet rescue. And so people, uh, uh, there's a rabbit. My family likes rabbits. <laughs> 
Here's a rabbit, here's a puppy, here's a dog, here's a dog getting pulled out of a window, here's a snake, because it's New Orleans. Here's a little toy dog, and there's a bunch of kit, or cats. This has become extremely clear now. It was, it was sort of known before Katrina, but it really is clear now in the years since. The, the old condition was the American Red Cross would not accept animals at a shelter unless it was a service dog. That was a key reason why a lot of people did not go, did not evacuate. So I don't want to leave my dog. My dog's part of my family or whatever, right? And so that, that's, a, that's a real thing. Um, so first environment is save my pets. The next thing that'll come up is, and so I'm talking about Katrina now, but I'm also talking about this is the template for how these things play out. The next thing is, oh my God, environment is a threat. Danger, 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 danger. So, uh, cottonmouth, a, a poisonous snake, alligators, feral dogs. That, you know, when people are gone for months on end, these dogs are like Rrr. they start to a lot of them will form packs. And if you got a pack of pit bulls, kind of angry, that's uh, not an easy thing to deal with, right? Uh, and then the waterborne diseases, things like the spread of mosquitoes that will spread disease, et cetera. So here, for example, is the data for West Nile virus. West Nile virus, a, non, a, a, a virus that did not exist in the U.S. before 1999. Introduced from, well, from Africa, as the name would maybe imply. Um, first shows up, first definitive case uh, in, near New York and then Eastern Seaboard, and then it spreads across the US. So by this point, it's in Louisiana. And we, we track this with sentinel chickens. We have chickens out in coops around the country, and we take blood. And, and we see if the, they have you know, antigens to, the, to this uh, virus. Uh, if people are sick, we can test people, but a lot of people get it and they just, most people just have a little minor cold. And so you, you don't, it's hard to know exactly how many humans are impacted unless we do tests. But so what we're looking at here is, this is, uh, sometimes people do get sick and we do test for them. These are people typically more severely sick. And so we know definitively how many cases. So here we go, check it out. Here's the year, January, a case. February, a case, nothing, 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 nothing. The wet, hot summer season comes, the mosquito season. And oh my God, more cases, more cases, more cases. West Nile, none. West Nile did not go away. All the chickens were drowned. All the people were killed or moved away. So there was no, no environmental monitors to go out there and check. So it's not that West Nile went away. It's that our ability to monitor West Nile went away. So one of the things that President Bush does is he essentially releases folks from all, from not all, but a large number of environmental laws and environmental constraints. So then people start going, I'm a spray. So we start spraying way more aggressively and way more intense, intently than we, than is legally typically allowed. So everything, herbicide, 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 herbicide or, uh, um, insecticide, 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 insecticide. Because people were freaked out that all this extra water plus the lack of the typical vector control methods and suppression methods were, was going to lead to a massive epidemic of, of things, cholera and, and, and yellow fever and things of that nature. So a friend of mine, uh, did I tell you guys a story about the insects? I can't remember if I told you guys that story. So, so a friend of mine who's now a professor at San Francisco State did his PhD in Louisiana and he went back to visit a friend and he is out in rural, rural Louisiana and <laughs> and they're out on it. So a lot of people in Louisiana, it's hot inside the house, so they have uh, porches. And this particular one was, was screened off, so you can go sit in the porch in the summer afternoon and, or evening and be a little cooler. So he's sitting on the porch with his friend. His friend says, you want a beer? And he goes, yeah, I want a beer. So his friend goes inside to get him a beer. And so he's sitting there rocking by himself on the chair at nighttime, across the street, a street light, he's sitting there rocking in, in the chair, and all of a sudden he stopped. And he went, what the hell? And he started getting this super creepy feeling. And he couldn't place the feeling, like, what? Something was really, really wrong. And he's like looking around, he can't figure it out. Takes him a couple seconds and he finally realizes he doesn't hear any buzzing. So Louisiana, tons of insects. It's the swamp, there's crickets, there's this, there's that, there's chirp, there's that, there's buzz, there's crickle, crickle, crickle. 
deathly silent. And he looks across the street light that normally there'd be a thousand million moths or whatever flying in the light, nothing. And while we don't know for sure, almost assuredly that's because we insecticided the hell out of this region of Louisiana because people are so freaked out of the, the, the mosquitoes getting out of control. Um, I think, I think we'll, um, we'll, I'm gonna show you one more video and then we'll pause for the night. So we'll pick this up in terms of the degradation and the impacts next week. 